I'm not sure if anyone could tell, but uh, last week's video drained me. I almost regret remembering the Prince and Me existed. However, it was easy content for my ADD brain. I just had to focus on it for like an ungodly amount of time. Luckily, my brain remembers some not so brain numbing films too. Case in point, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. The only memory of this film I had going in was the ending. I don't think I'd seen a single other scene. With my limited knowledge, I was surprised I even knew it was a musical without looking it up. Yes, I, I said musical. Unlike Mamma Mia, this contains original music. However, fun fact, the original plan was to use period-appropriate folk songs, but it became too difficult to find music that fit the story, so the decision was made to make their own songs. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is based on the story The Sobbing Women. The film was also supposed to share the story's title, but uh, producers didn't think that the name would draw in the crowd. They might have been right. Another fun fact, the second name was A Bride for Seven Brothers, obviously meaning each brother gets a bride, but Again, the higher-ups thought it sounded a little too scandalous. Directed by Stanley Donan, who also directed Singing in the Rain and the 1974 The Little Prince, and also starring Howard Keel from Annie Gitch Gun and Calamity Jane, and Jane Powell from Royal Wedding and Hit the Deck. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers was released July 15th, 1954, and was famously given a cut budget in favor of other films by the producers because they didn't think they would do well. Seven Brides <laughs> earned more than all the other films. The synopsis goes as follows. During the 1850s, Millie, a pretty young cook, marries Adam, a grizzled woodsman after a brief courtship. When the two return to Adam's farm, Millie is shocked to meet his six ill-mannered brothers, all of whom live in his cabin. She promptly begins teaching the brothers proper behavior, and most importantly, how to court a woman. But after the brothers kidnap six local girls during a town barn raising, a group of indignant villagers tries to track them down. Yes, you heard right. This film is very of its time, but also better than you'd expect. Now, get those feet stomping, and let's explore Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. We start off with some establishing shots before meeting our main male protagonist, Adam. Adam here has come into town to do some trading, and while picking up some supplies, it supposes he should just get himself a wife. And you wouldn't have a wife under the counter there. I'm looking for a wife. You see, Adam has six younger brothers back at home, and they could really use a woman around to cook and clean because they're basically useless at anything domestic. The shopkeeper's wife does not approve of Adam taking one of the limited women for a wife. Let me tell you, none of our gals is going to go off to Bear Country with you to cook and wash and slave for seven slummocky backwoodsmen. But that's not going to stop him. As he walks through the town, Adam sings a little ditty about what he wants in a wife and compares that to the women he sees. Pretty and trim, but kind of slim. Heavenly eyes, but oh, that size. She's got to be right to be the bride for me. It's this song that had me fall in love with Howard's voice. It's just so bassy and deep and I love it. Finally, Adam stumbles upon a little lady who is chopping wood all by her lonesome before her boss calls her in to serve food to the hungry customers. This is our main female protagonist, Millie. And man, is she a good cook. Her skills in the kitchen have every man proposing to her, including our boy, Adam. How about it? How about what? I just told you. How about marrying me? I'd have to finish my chores. Strangely enough, Millie agrees, and Adam goes off to clean up and get a pastor. It's a small and quick ceremony where the pastor straight up asks Millie if she's being forced. Now say it plain, Millie, into your face. I don't like this marriage. But she assures him that this is what she wants. There's just something about Adam that she's willing to throw caution to the wind, and off they go, riding through the mountains to Adam's family farm. Because they've 
only just met each other like I don't know an hour before the ride was a little awkward oh, what is there to say to a spouse you've never met before that day Millie tries to break the tension by singing about how happy and hopeful she is for their future and how spectacular it will be to only have to cook and clean for one man always back at the end when I hear all the men yelling and screaming for their dinners I think how wonderful it would be to cook and care for one man. Now that it's happened, I can't hardly believe it's true. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, so since the proposal was, you know, so soon and there wasn't much time for Adam to give her, like, the rundown of his family and living situation, and I guess since he's not used to talking to women, he didn't know how to break the news to her now that, you know, they're married. And... Unfortunately, uh, the journey doesn't last forever, and Millie meets Adam's brother. This is uh, my brother, Caleb. And the other brother. My brother's uh, Ephraim and Daniel. And, and the other brother. And, and this here is uh, Benjamin. And This is Frank. And this here is Gideon. So she's basically going to have to do the, the same thing she was doing in the inn back in town, but like now she doesn't get paid. So Adam here he's the oldest as i said before then there's benjamin caleb daniel ephraim frank and gideon the story is that their father rest in peace wanted to name all the kids in the alphabetical order to keep track easier and he would have liked to get through the whole dang alphabet and their mother god rest her soul wanted to give them all biblical names millie points out that she doesn't recall anyone in the bible named Frank, and that's because his full name is Frankincense. His real name is Frank. <laughs> He's a little touchy about it. After a quick house tour, Adam leaves Millie to the cooking. When she calls them in for dinner, she's struck with the realization that these men are practically animals with no manners whatsoever, including her husband. After she angrily marches to her room, the men wait around for Adam to go on consummate the marriage he's very aware that he's uh angered his wife but he can't look like a pansy in front of his brothers adam picks himself up by the bootstraps and heads to his millie's room it doesn't go well it's been a right busy day you must be kind of tuckered out that's right shall i uh turn down the covers can if you like but i'm not going to pay but after storming out, the brothers are right there to be all, you know, condescending. So he lies and just says, oh, his bride just needs some water. Before returning to his room just to crawl out the window. <laughs> A bit dramatic, but uh, go off, I guess. Millie eventually concedes to letting Adam share the bed after she talks out her frustrations with Adam. And Adam explains that he didn't, he didn't want to ruin her fantasy back in the carriage, which I kind of guess... And he just wasn't trying to embarrass her. Still should have said something. The next day, the other six wake up to the smell of bacon and coffee, but are, you know, upset to find their clothes are missing. Millie tells them that she's washing them, but also needs their night clothes. They're not too happy to hear this and try, you know, throwing their weight around, only to be bullied into giving in by a, a five-foot petite woman. Now do I get that winter underwear? Do I have to come in and take it off you? So they have breakfast wrapped in their blankets. Millie tells them that she's going to show them how to be proper gentlemen, starting off with cleaning themselves up and some decent table manners. Some time passes and Millie starts to show the six how to properly court a lady, including dancing, all in preparation for the annual barn raising, which is like a whole big shindig and will be the perfect occasion to find them a woman to court. Now, there are some ground rules Millie sets for the boys beforehand, and the most important one is absolutely no fighting. It didn't go too well the last time they went into town. At the barn raising, a small group of town's girls are just so happy to see Millie, and uh, quite enamored with the group of redheads she brought along with her. Each one of the brothers takes Millie's advice and helps the little ladies carry their goods to the tables, all except Gideon, the youngest, who simply escorts the little Miss Alice back to the party. And now it's time for a good old-fashioned line dance competition <laughs> between the brothers and the townspeople. The sequence lasts like 15 minutes. 
After all that exercise, the brothers seem to have won the affections of their girlies, but can they win the barn raising competition? The first team to complete their side wins this little calf, and Millie would really like to have it. Mr. Perkins, you can put the seven of us brothers down for one team. Millie says she's taking a fancy to Annabelle. Unfortunately, the men of the town don't quite like the brothers coming in and stealing the ladies' attention, so there are some accidents. Hey, Bill, get that board up there. But, per Millie's warnings, the boys do not engage in any fighting, much to Adam's dismay. That is, until some townie hurts Adam for no good reason, and then all hell breaks loose. Easy to say, they don't win the calf, and probably won't be able to court their lady loves. Cue the six's depressive arc. I'm a lonesome Millie's mighty worried for the brothers and gets exceptionally upset when Caleb announces that he might just be moving away and get away from it all. You see, Millie had this like, dream that all the brothers would get married and settle down close by so her and Adam's children would have their cousins to play with. Adam takes it upon himself to cheer up the boys and gives them the wonderful, fantastic, beautiful, amazingly thought out plan of just skipping the whole courting business why bother just whisk the girls away and you know kidnap them he got his uh big brain idea from a book of millie i think he read it wrong but this is why you shouldn't read i guess oh yes same women was sob and sob and sob and fit to be tied every muscle was throbbing throbbing from that riotous ride so off they go each brother goes and literally grabs himself a girl and stuffs her in the family wagon and as they're making their way back home with the fuzz and basically the whole town hot on their trail they purposely cause an avalanche in the only path between their farm and the town all right let him go <laughs> so now there's no way to get back to town and return the girls which doesn't exactly please millie to hear when she finds out about all this. With the ladies distraught and no way home, Millie banishes all the brothers to the barn. And I mean all the brothers. Adam's really in the in the doghouse now. Since he has no emotional understanding, Adam decides that he's just gonna go head up to the hunting cabin and spend the winter there instead of trying to mend his relationship with his wife and, you know, apologizing. So the girls take the boys' room and after a few days the brothers start showing up to the house with odd requests and random injuries before Millie just puts her foot down. Anyway, after that confrontation, the ladies confront each other about their obvious crushes on the brothers. Is it love or is it Stockholm Syndrome? But in comes Millie, and as usual, she puts a stop to the fighting, but this time she, you know, announces that she's pregnant. You see, I, I'm counting on all of you to help me, because I'm going to have a baby. Everyone's real happy for Millie, but gets the ladies a thinking about marriage and babies and starting a family and maybe a certain red-headed man. Time passes and passes and passes. The women are officially being courted by their captors. All is well. And then Millie goes into labor. The brothers are all worried, especially since nobody has bothered to tell Adam that Millie was even pregnant. The ladies have it handled though and the brothers are all now uncles to a beautiful little girl. Finally, someone has some common sense as Gideon goes off to the hunting cabin to tell Adam the news and ask him to just give up on his pride and come meet his daughter. He tries his best to knock some sense into his older brother, but is turned away in the end. Oops, spoke too soon. After a thrilling game of musical chairs, Adam barges in. After everyone leaves the room, Millie properly introduces Adam to their daughter, who she is yet to name. I was thinking of some name like Hannah or Hagar or Hepzibah, picking up where your mother left off. Hannah. Hannah was the only not awful choice here. Since hearing the news of his daughter and doing some deep thinking, Adam realizes how much it would fucking suck to have his daughter be kidnapped and forced to marry someone, so he makes the decision to take the girls back since the past is cleared up now. Little does he know that the girls are eavesdropping and do not 
want to leave their bow. And little does anyone know that the town folk are on their way to steal their girls back and lynch the brothers. Thus, a game of hide and seek is initiated. You see, to an outsider, this uh, this looks really bad. After the girls' fathers grabs their daughters, but before they can hang the brothers, Alice's father and the town pastor confronts the ladies about the baby that he heard while sneaking around the property. Oh no, not that. A while back I heard a wee babe crying in the house. Whose is it? Mine! With that quick thinking, all six brothers now got themselves some brides via a shotgun wedding. The end. I like this movie a lot. And before you say anything, I know, it's problematic nowadays. Hell, the actual story would have been problematic back when it was filmed if it was set in the 50s and not, you know, the 1850s. But the movie is just too silly to take seriously anyway. I love the singing, especially from Howard and Jane. The dancing was so much fun, kept me entertained and the plot was simple enough to hold my attention. To be fair, the mystery of which brother was which and which girl was who also kept me from zoning out. Altogether, it was a fun little romp and shouldn't be taken too seriously. And when it comes to legitimate critiques, I have a few. I, I'm fully aware that this is a musical and with musicals comes the occasional, you know, musical dance break. But Seven Brides takes it, like, too far. The dancing scene at the barn raising was, like, well over 10 minutes, if not 15. And if it wasn't for some of the stunts, I think I would have skipped ahead. Some could say that they were padding the runtime, but I can't say anything for sure. As I mentioned before, the studio thought that the other movies being produced at the time would bring in more money. So a good chunk of the budget was taken away, which resulted in indoor sets having to be built instead of filming outside on location. I won't judge the makers of the movie too hard on this, because they honestly did as well as they could have given the hand that they were dealt. What I will judge them on is the casting choices they made. All the women that played the brides were trained dancers, which is perfect, but only one of them could actually sing. All the others were dubbed over, and out of the seven brothers, only five could dance. Howard was only a actor and singer, but he didn't have a lot of dance scenes anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. But the actor who played Caleb was originally a minor league baseball player. He didn't have any acting, singing, dancing background, so if you pay attention, you'll notice that in most of the scenes with group dancing, He's just like off to the side, kind of nodding along. I wonder if it was too hard to find actors that could do all three, you know, dance, act, and sing, or if it was just a budget thing. Oh, and fun fact, did you know that all the brothers became redheads to distinguish them from the other, like, townsfolk? I found uh, this interesting because I, for the life of me, could not tell the difference between the brothers. <laughs> Or really the the brides either. They all looked different, but I just couldn't keep track of the names. I said that it kept me focused on the movie, but I think, you know, I might have been focusing on the wrong thing. I guess I was just supposed to remember their faces from that one time they were introduced and go from there, but like, I'm not that great with faces, so I'm shit out of luck. Compared to other musicals I've seen before, I'd give this movie like a like a 6 out of 10. It's fun enough and entertaining, but the music isn't very memorable, and that's kind of key in the musical world. Like, how else are 15-year-old theater kids going to keep themselves entertained without singing show tunes? That's it for fictional scenarios. Let's move on to some very real cases of forced marriages, a nonprofit trying to make a difference. Unchained at Last is a survivor led nonprofit organization dedicated to ending forced and child marriage in the United States through direct services and advocacy. Unchained provides crucial legal and social services, always for free, to help women, girls, and others in the United States to escape arranged or forced marriages and rebuild their lives. At the same time, Unchained pushes for social policy and legal change. The organization started and now leads a growing national movement to eliminate child marriage in every U.S. state and at the federal level. I will leave a link to their website below if you would like more information or how to donate.
Now, wasn't that just a foot tap and knee slap and good time? Any suggestions on other musicals or cheesy rom-coms, please leave them in the comment section down below. If you have any questions or criticism, same place, I ask that you try your best to be kind because I'm a sensitive child. Farewell.